What's up? Today I'll be looking at some of the best blockchain ETFs on the market. These ETFs can provide investment opportunities for those who maybe don't want to buy cryptocurrency itself because they don't know which ones will be the winners, but they believe in the overall transformative potential of the blockchain and want exposure to that in a more conventional way. Or maybe they're just looking to diversify their exposure to the crypto industry in addition to the crypto that they already hold. As for this video, we'll briefly define blockchain technology because we can't invest in something that we don't understand. For each ETF, we'll look at exposure strategy, portfolio composition, top holdings, cost, past performance, and analyst ratings. At the end, I'll give my own opinion. If at any point you decide you like this video and find it helpful, don't forget to hit the like button because that's what it's there for. Also, feel free to lurk down below and check out the links in the description. You can get free stocks, free crypto, and other fun stuff. So without further ado, let's get started. Blockchain is a specific type of database that stores information in blocks that are chained together in chronological order. When a blockchain is decentralized, no person, group, or location has control over it. Instead, all users have collective control. A decentralized blockchain system provides a public, immutable, verifiable, and irreversible timeline of data. In the case of Bitcoin transactions, a network of peer-to-peer -peer computers across the world will solve equations to validate transactions and secure the network. Blockchain helps in the verification and traceability of multi-step transactions. It can provide secure transactions, reduce compliance costs, and speed up data transfer processing. Blockchain technology can help with contract management and with auditing the origin of products. It can also be used in voting platforms and in managing titles and deeds. The applications of blockchain technology can be completely revolutionary. The internet was and is revolutionary, providing an incredible investment opportunity for investors who are able to see the potential and properly allocate capital accordingly. Many people are calling blockchain technology Internet 2.0. As investors, it's important for us to recognize and understand potentially revolutionary technology. This kind of disruptive innovation can provide incredible investment opportunities. Just ask the people who bought Bitcoin early. But many people are saying that we are still in the early innings of blockchain technology and that the best use cases are still to be discovered. Also, sometimes it's a good idea to pay close attention to what the smartest people are doing. It seems like many of the smartest people are currently working on blockchain technology. So this is only an incredibly brief overview of blockchain technology. I have to stop myself from rambling too much so we can get to the ETFs. So let's introduce the ETFs. Block is the transformational data sharing ETF by Amplify Investments. This is an actively managed ETF that seeks to provide total return by investing at least 80% of its net assets in equity securities of companies actively involved in the development and utilization of blockchain technologies. BLCN is the NASDAQ Next Gen Economy ETF by Siren Advisors. This ETF seeks to invest in companies that are committed to developing, researching, and utilizing blockchain technologies. Next we have Ledger, the Innovative Transaction and Process ETF by First Trust. This ETF tracks the performance of companies that are either actively using, investing in, developing, or have products that are poised to benefit from blockchain technology. Lastly, we have DAP, the Digital Transformation ETF by Vanek. This ETF invests in worldwide companies that are driving the blockchain revolution. The ETF continually adapts to include pure plays on the blockchain megatrend. Currently, it includes crypto exchanges, crypto miners, payment companies, crypto holders, traders, and specialists in blockchain's patents and services. All these ETFs came to market in 2018, except DAP, which came to market in 2021. Block is notably larger than the other three, with over a billion dollars in assets under management. This matters for things like liquidity and spread costs. It's worth reiterating that Block is actively managed while the other three are passively managed. Active management typically comes with higher management costs and usually greater tax inefficiency because of the increased buying and selling. The long-term statistics on active management are grim. Most managers fail to beat the index over time, but it all depends on how much you like the active management team, because a small percentage of them do indeed outperform. Moving on to portfolio composition, let's take a look at regional exposure. Block, BLCN, and DAP have the most US exposure at around 60%. Ledger is the most globally diverse with North American, Asian, and European exposure at roughly 30% each. Many investors choose to stay with U.S. equities as they have historically outperformed international equities, but this is no guarantee in the future. It's also worth noting that while Ledger has 30% Asian exposure, only 10% of that is Chinese companies. I say this because many investors are hesitant to invest in Chinese companies. While many of them are indeed great companies, you have to deal with the governmental uncertainty that comes with the Chinese Communist Party. As far as market cap goes, Block and DAP have the most small cap exposure at around 50%. Ledger is almost all large cap at 96%, and BLCN is mostly large cap at 70%.
Large caps are generally seen as safer, more stable investments that can better weather negative events because of their increased size and resources. Small caps are often seen as more volatile and risky, and with that, returns can be less consistent. However, small cap companies can be more nimble and can quicker capitalize on new trends to increase their growth potential. While small caps are more likely to get hit harder in a market crisis, they have attractive upside in the bull market that can make it worth the risk for many investors. But of course, these are generalizations and can vary on a case-by-case basis. Big is not always safe, small is not always risky. So let's move on to industry exposure. I will briefly show the industry exposure graphics, but I don't think they help us understand very well as the blockchain economy is very narrow and niche. I don't think these classifications are specific enough for our needs. In fact, that is actually the challenge with blockchain ETFs at this point. It's hard to build a pure play portfolio, and sometimes you end up with legacy holdings in there that you wouldn't expect. But I will point out that banks are the largest holding in Ledger, but we will look at that in more detail as we go through the top holdings. So let's get some more clarity by looking at the top holdings. Ledger has the most holdings at over 100 and the lowest concentration in the top 10 names. DAP has the fewest holdings at just over 25 and the highest concentration in the top 10 names. So while Ledger may be the most diverse in terms of the number of holdings, this seems to make it less of a pure blockchain play than the others. When we go through the holdings, we see that some more legacy blue chip large cap names such as Nvidia, AMD, Oracle, Microsoft. Looking further into the holdings, I found names like AT&T, Honeywell, SoftBank, Goldman Sachs, Cisco, Walmart, and Verizon, and a lot of banks like I mentioned before. So while these companies do have some secondary exposure to the blockchain, Ledger is definitely not the purest blockchain play on this list. But ultimately, it depends on the investor's individual risk tolerance and the kind of exposure that they seek. Looking at the top 10 of BLCM, we see names like Coinbase, Square, AMD, Marathon Digital, MicroStrategy, NVIDIA, and Microsoft. So we've got some exchanges, some mining companies, some semiconductor companies, and also some legacy tech names. It's no surprise that we see semiconductor companies in these ETFs as they provide the hardware for cryptocurrency mining. MicroStrategy is, of course, a microsailers company. This man has borderline YOLO'd MicroStrategy's entire balance sheet into Bitcoin and a ton of his own money as well, to the point where the stock tends to trade with the Bitcoin price movements, and thus people have started to use the stock as a proxy for getting Bitcoin exposure. If the price of Bitcoin continues to soar, it could be one of the greatest trades of all time. If not, it'll be one of the worst. There are 70 holdings in BLCN. Like Ledger, it has a lot of large cap legacy tech names that aren't pure blockchain plays, but do provide some secondary exposure. I would say it's more of a pure play than Ledger, but not quite as pure as Block and DAP. So moving on to Block, we have names like MicroStrategy, HUD8 Mining, Marathon Digital, Square, PayPal, NVIDIA, and Coinbase in the top 10. This ETF seems to provide a diverse exposure to companies across the blockchain space while not being too watered down by too many companies that really only have secondary exposure to the blockchain space. Last is DAP. Again, this ETF only has 26 holdings, and I would say it's probably the purest blockchain play on this list. Looking at the top 10, we do see some similar names as the other ETFs. Marathon Digital, Square, Coinbase, MicroStrategy, Riot Blockchain, etc. But nearly every company on this ETF is directly and specifically involved in crypto and blockchain in some way or another. We see crypto exchanges, miners, crypto payment companies, crypto holders, and blockchain service companies. Ultimately, it comes down to if an investor wants a pure concentrated exposure to the space or if they prefer a more broad diversification across the industry. Also, the level of concentration can help an investor choose how much they are willing to allocate to each ETF. If the ETF has broad and diversified exposure, maybe they would feel more comfortable with having a higher percentage in their portfolio. But if it's highly concentrated, maybe they would keep it to a smaller percentage. Or maybe they would just yellow all their money into it because diversification is for those who don't know what they're doing. Not financial advice. Next, let's look at cost. And I hate to be Debbie Downer, but a lot of these specialized blockchain ETFs have expensive expense ratios, that being the annual cost that we have to pay for management. Block charge is 0.71%, 0.68% for BLCN, 0.65% for Ledger, and 0.5% for DAP. I threw DAP into this list because it has one of the lowest expense ratios for the blockchain ETFs on the market. So DAP wins on expense ratio. Again, block is actively managed and 0.71% is not terrible for active management, but I'm not going to sugarcoat it. These fees are high particularly when they get up in the 0.6 to 0.7% range, which may not sound like much, but there are S&P 500 ETF issuers that charge 0.03 and 0.04% annually, which is basically nothing. Granted, obviously they track a different index and anyone that buys these specialized ETFs is hoping for excess returns that will blow the S&P out of the water. So at the same time, we do have to be careful to not step over dollars to pick up pennies, but small differences in costs can add up to large differences over time. 
You don't really think about it in a bull market, but it can be a real bummer in a bear market when your portfolio goes down or sideways and you're getting eaten into by fees. This calculator shows the concept. If you invest $6,000 a year into two ETFs, one with a 0.71% expense ratio and the other with a 0.03% expense ratio, assuming equal returns of 6%, the 0.71% expense ratio will cost you $157,000 more over 40 years. But again, this assumes all other things are equal, which is a big assumption. Blockchain ETFs will not trade like an S&P 500 ETF. But actually, that's not even true. Ledger is so broadly diversified across large caps that it kind of does trade like the S&P, but more on that later. The problem with these newer specialty ETFs is that sometimes we don't have great data on them. So as much as I like looking at tracking difference, I was unable to find tracking difference data. So let's look at average spread. Spread is the measure of liquidity and the cost of trading shares. Essentially, the difference between the lowest ask price and the highest bid price. The lower the spread is, the lower the cost is to trade. Typically, the larger a fund is and the larger the trading volume, the lower the spread. Also, large caps tend to have greater liquidity. The average spread is as follows, 0.13% for Block, 0.43% for BLCN, 0.33% for Ledger, and 0.49% for DAP. So it's no surprise that Block wins here as it's the largest and most liquid ETF. While spread is important for traders frequently moving large amounts of shares, it's less important for a buy and hold investor. So let's take a look at performance. As we will see, some of these ETFs trade closely with the crypto market and some of them don't. Because they are so new, we have no long-term data to look at, particularly for DAP. Looking at three-year returns, Block is the winner, averaging 37%, BLCN is at 27%, and Ledger is at 15%. Looking at one year, we have a whopping 99% return for Block, and 35% for both BLCN and Ledger. The crypto market has been strong over the last year, and given that Block is more of a concentrated Bitcoin play than the other two, it's no surprise that it performed well in tandem with the crypto market. This can be better seen when we pull up the one-year graphs. Block's graph looks similar to Bitcoin's graph. I'm assuming DAP would trade in a similar way if we had more to look at. Unfortunately for DAP, it IPO'd right before a crash in the crypto market, so its graph doesn't look too hot. But like I mentioned earlier, the graph of Ledger looks pretty similar to the graph of the S&P 500. It's pretty diversified across the legacy large cap names. So it's not the same, but it's not extremely different. Investors just need to decide if they want their ETF to trade with the crypto market or not. Investors love to look at performance. We should also consider how much risk we are taking to get such performance, aka risk-adjusted returns. Taking risk can be great in a risk-on environment, but when the tide turns and goes back out, you find out who is swimming without a bathing suit on. So to analyze risk, we can look at Sharpe ratio. The Sharpe ratio adjusts a portfolio's past performance or expected future performance for the excess risk that was taken by the investor. A high Sharpe ratio is good when compared to similar portfolios or funds with lower returns. However, the Sharpe ratio uses volatility to determine risk, which is not an unreasonable assumption, but it's also not a perfect comparison. Block and BLCN both have Sharpe ratios of a little bit over 1, while Ledger is down around 0.72. For reference, the S&P 500 is at 0.93. This can also be seen with the graph as Block is way out as being the most high-risk, high-reward ETF. But again, we don't have data for DAP. I would expect it to be similar to Block, but maybe a little bit more risky but we don't see the same high-flying volatility from BLCN and Ledger. It all comes down to the, ind the investor's individual risk tolerance and portfolio allocation. Lastly, let's take a look at analyst ratings, and specifically Morningstar ratings. Block got four stars, BLCN got three stars, and Ledger only got one star. No rating is available for DAP. So what are my thoughts? I'm a fan of crypto, although I currently only own the blue chip cryptocurrencies to speak, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a little bit of Cardano. I am looking to open some positions into some other altcoins as well, however, carefully so, and only after doing extensive research on each project. I don't feel the need to take excessive risk on low market rando altcoins. I feel as though the blue chips have enough potential as it is that I don't need to overextend myself on the risk curve. As far as the ETFs on today's list, I don't currently own any of them, but I could see myself opening up positions in the future. My favorites would probably be Block and DAP, just because they give the most concentrated exposure to the blockchain space. Don't get me wrong, I think BLCN and Ledger are good ETFs, but the blockchain exposure is definitely watered down. But again, some people may prefer that for risk mitigation. I just think that they have some fat expense ratios for the exposure that you get to some legacy names like AT&T, Walmart, JP Morgan, Cisco, etc. I'm not hating on these companies, but you can own them for next to nothing in the S&P 500. I'm always wary of active management, so that's really my issue with Block. For DAP, I think the 50 basis point expense ratio is reasonable for the exposure that you get. My issue with DAP is that it's still so new. I might like to see some more history before I buy.
But if I had to buy one, I would probably buy Block, despite the active management. I think the exposure has some good concentration, but it's also well-rounded in the space. The one thing that I will say about the crypto market is that it really still seems to trade with the halving cycles of Bitcoin. People expect that this correlation may slow down as time goes on, but for now, that seems to be how it is. The price of Bitcoin tends to have boom and bust cycles depending on which stage of the halving cycle we are in. For that reason, it might not be a bad idea to time these purchases of these ETFs accordingly, particularly for the ones that have high correlation to the crypto market. This would mean picking up some shares during or hopefully towards the end of a crypto winter and then holding for the boom cycle. I never advocate trying to time the market, but the halving cycles of Bitcoin are transparent and predictable. Also, another thing that I tend to use with my crypto purchases and also possibly blockchain ETF purchases is the Crypto Fear and Greed Index. This gives us the idea of the overall crypto market sentiment. Like Warren Buffett once said, be fearful when others are greedy, be greedy when others are fearful. Obviously, there will be exceptions to this, but in general, it's not a bad way of looking at things. Not financial advice, of course. But if you found any of this helpful, consider hitting the like button and subscribe for more content like this. Also consider checking out the links down below. Currently down there you can get two free stocks of Weeble, potentially valued up to $2,300, $30 with M1 Finance, a free stock of Robinhood, potentially valued up to $225, and up to $250 with BlockFi, where you can earn interest on your crypto. However, these promos do change over time. As always, this is not financial advice, just for entertainment purposes only. So thanks and I'll see you in the next video.